Good evening. If you have a mobile, if you'd like to put it on silent, please. Thank you. Right, massive welcome back to Kevin Rowan Druitt with the Glastonbury Zodiac. Set within the landscape around mysterious Glastonbury are depictions of the Zodiac, possibly thousands of years old, but only rediscovered in the 1920s. Kevin, author, astrologer, musician and lecturer, who has appeared on Sky TV and Radio Lancashire, will cover the deeper meanings of these unusual depictions. Their discoverer, Catherine Maltwood, and mysteriously, they're linked with Arthurian legend. Please welcome Kevin Rowan Druid. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Um, I uh, first got into the Glastonbury Zodiac in a very peculiar way. I was in a, a thing called a library. Do you remember them? Uh, they had these things called books. And there was this book called The Seventh Sword. Um, I forget who it was written by now. Uh, I only remember this story in my head when I was driving over. And I wasn't interested in the book whatsoever, except in the back. There was two pages about the Kabbalah, which was something that I was just getting into at the time. Uh, I won't go into all, all that. I'm sure you all know what the Kabbalah is. Uh, so I just got the book out just to have this explanation. And then, of course, you do what you do. You start reading the book and what's it all interesting about. And it's all about this um, qu psychic question. Um, and uh, in, in it, <laughs> this guy uh, started to discover that there were these seven swords hidden in Britain. And one of them he saw displayed on this program about the Glastonbury Zodiac. Uh, there's a sort of picture of it in the book, and I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So uh, I started actually trying to find more about it, and so for the last 20 years I've been spending my time researching this and going down to Glastonbury. Uh, Glastonbury was always a place I've always wanted to go because uh, you hear so much about it. I mean, not only for the obvious with the, uh, the Glastonbury Music Festival and all that, but all the other stuff of the Arthurian stories there and about Joseph of Arimathea. And I'm, I'm going to have a brief whip through all that uh, in a minute. Um, and fortunately, when my uh, second wife's um, ex-husband moved with the children down to Bristol, it meant we were going down to Bristol a lot and I was able to hop on off to Glastonbury for the day and, and visit some of the, some of the various sites. So, um, just out of interest, how many of you have been to Glastonbury? Quite a few, quite a lot, yeah, about half of you. Uh, it's famous, of course, that, I'm going to see if I can work this. Yay! <laughs> so, um, uh, this is the thing that uh, Glastonbury is most famous for, of course, <coughs> is the, uh, the Glastonbury uh, Music Festival that takes place every summer. Uh, Sorry? Who's the gay guy? Well, it's not me. <laughs> uh, uh, it, actually, as it says, um, madness on the stage there. Oh, look, I can get, I get use of the, I get to use the laser. See, it says madness. So, Elton. So it's not Elton John. It's it's a member of madness, obviously. Chaz Smash. That's it. The one who does the. Yeah. Yeah. The old dance, the dance that every man can do. Uh, so yeah, so Glastonbury obviously is very famous. Well, it actually is just outside uh, Glastonbury, isn't it? Uh, this is Glastonbury Tor. Uh, a tor is the West Country name for a hill. Uh, Glastonbury Tor is a very unusual uh, tor because uh, it has this labyrinth carved into it, and. Uh, Many uh, pilgrims go there to walk the labyrinth. So you, so you walk around it one, it's all one continuous path and it takes you around it and brings you back again. Um, lots of stories about Glastonbury Tor. Um, in case you don't know, um, the, the word Glastonbury, uh, it means the island of glass. And this is because um, uh, in the olden days, before, before the uh, levels, well, these are the, the levels that you see in the background, the Somerset levels. Before they were cleared by drainage, the whole of Glastonbury was surrounded by water, so it looked like it was like glass, so it looked like an island sitting in glass. Berry is an old word for hill. Uh, so, and uh, there you see St Michael's uh, Church on the top. Uh, 
very famous because it's actually like, it gives what, it's one of the uh, churches that gives its name to the, the St. Michael's Ley Line. This is the, uh, the longest straight line you can draw across England and it's aligned with the sunrise on the May Day. And uh, as I say, it runs from St. Michael's Mount down there, uh, down in Cornwall, and on the, uh, the very edge there, right up, all through, and it goes through Glastonbury, and then on to Hopton, up on the, uh, the coast, which is just between Lowestoft and, uh, and Great Yarmouth. Uh, a very famous ley line, I do a talk about it, I've driven most of it and visited most of the sites on it, it's a very interesting idea. Uh, of course, this is uh, Glastonbury Abbey. Um, before the dissolution of the uh, monasteries by Henry VIII, uh, Glastonbury Abbey was one of the most powerful um, abbeys in the country. Very, very rich, and second only to Canterbury. And uh, said to be the resting place of King Arthur. This is his, this is his tomb. Uh, this, uh, a lot of controversy surrounds this so-called find because the, uh, the abbey actually burnt to the ground in like the 11th century and the, uh, the monks needed to raise some money and lo and behold about a year later they found King Arthur there. Um, when they were digging down they found this cross that, and it actually said about here lies King Arthur and all this. This sort of disappeared in, somewhere in the, eight, in the uh, 20th century. But so, you know, the place is, uh, is full of Arthurian legend, as we will come to see in a minute. This is the famous Glastonbury Thorn. Uh, you can see the tour there in the background. This stands on Weary All Hill, um, which uh, abbreviates to the Wirral, funnily enough. Well, it's nothing to do with Liverpool in that area. Um, the story goes that Jesus' uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, the person who... Um, actually owned the, the cave, the tomb that Jesus was put in when he disappears after his crucifixion. Joseph Arimathea was a very rich man, he was a tin merchant and he owned mines in Cornwall and often came, came to Britain. Um, he's only mentioned once in the Bible, but in some of the other Gospels that were taken out of the Bible or didn't go into the Bible, he's mentioned quite a lot more. And it's the basis of, of course he said he brought his, uh, his nephew Jesus with him and this is where Blake's poem about Jerusalem, you know, and did those feet in ancient time, walk upon England's pastures, green. Uh, and uh, it said that Joseph of Arimathea, when him and his 12 disciples uh, rolled up on Weary or Hill when they were fleeing Israel after the uh, crucifixion, uh, he put his staff into the ground and this thorn tree grew from the staff, so the, the legend has it. Um, whether or not any of that's true or not. The interesting thing is that um, the actual, this thorn is not indigenous to England at all and it's, it's actually been traced genetically back to the Lebanon which is, which is quite interesting. Um, and it, uh, it flowers twice a year at Christmas and Easter and cuttings from it are taken to the, uh, put on the Queen's Christmas birthday, uh, Christmas table. I've got a birthday on the brain because it's been in the news so much. Uh, unfortunately, this is what the thorn looks like now, because a couple of years ago, somebody decided to take a chainsaw to it. This wasn't the first time this had happened, actually, in the Puritan times, it was, it was chopped down again. Fortunately, there's um, lots of cuttings have been taken from it, and it grows again in the, uh, the churchyard in, in the main high street. There's another, there's another cutting from it that grows in the, uh, the abbey grounds as well, so uh, it will be restored eventually. And uh, this is Joseph of Arimathea. This is uh, actually that's about the actual size of the the window in the St John's Church in the High Street in uh, in Glastonbury. And you'll see he holds in his hand these two cruets, which are said to contain the uh, the, the blood and um, waters of, of Christ that he collected from him when he was, when Jesus was on the uh, the cross. They were also said to have brought the Holy Grail and hidden it under Glastonbury Tor. Uh, but these are, all, these are all legends. This is the, the Chalice Well in the uh, Chalice Well Gardens. Um, 
which is a very lovely, peaceful place. It's open to all religions, all denominations, and it's a very peaceful place. Everybody goes there, uh, and a, a, it's pretty much a quiet place. It's all beautifully done, and it has this chalice well, which uh, flows from out of the tour. And it, uh, can you see the design on there on the... Uh, Yes, the rescue of Pisces. Yeah. Uh, two concentric circles that pass through the centre of, e of each other. Uh, and um, the, they've actually designed it lovely because the, the well flows into a pond shaped exactly the, the same. And um, to, uh, to Christians, this is the fish. And to uh, pagans, it's the yoni of the goddess. And as the, uh, the water is bright red, to Christians, it's the blood of Christ. To pagans, it's the menstrual blood of the goddess. So it, so it works both ways. Uh, but a very beautiful place to visit anyway. Uh, this is the basis of it. You can see the uh, two concentric circles. And what you do is you then, you can then form, this is the, where the, the, uh, the origin of the Gothic arch. Because if you then, you then extrapolate this down like that and that, and you get the, you get the uh, Gothic arch, which... You can actually see there on the uh, St Michael's Church Tower on the top of the Glastonbury Tour. The church, by the way, was destroyed in an earthquake in the 12th century, but the tower is, is still there. Um, I've climbed Glastonbury Tour many times. There's the, the easy way up, the way we're looking at here, which is the, it's the long way up, but it's easier. The, uh, there is a steeper way up around the, the back of it. And uh, many years ago, uh, me and my... Uh, wife at the time we were climbing up this uh, up this we got about halfway up and they're very thoughtfully they put a bench there and we were totally out of breath so we sat down and rested on the bench only to watch these two sort of octogenarians come rushing past on their way to the top making us feel very very old <laughs> uh, the um, two concentric circles right like that is also the, the base the, the stone age neolithic people knew about this because it's actually the basis for how you make um, one of their, their circles. This is a Long Meg and her daughters up in the uh, Cumbria, up in the, uh, the Eden Valley. And uh, the, the, the basis of it, you might not be able to see it from that picture, but it, actually the construction of it comes exactly from the, 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 same, the same way of using two concentric circles. This is the White Will, uh, which is the other one. The water here is clear. Uh, there's a, a nice tap where well, the water just flows constantly out of, out of the wall and you can just go along and collect your water for as much as you want. Free holy water, it's great. But I wouldn't recommend doing it at night because that's what I did. And uh, it's a bit scary, this road. It's only uh, the width of a car and you're standing in the road collecting the water and cars are coming past, so it's not too good. And here we have, uh, this is the white, the white well. Also, there's lots of other uh, spiritual connections with Glastonbury. Uh, does anybody know who this is? Her real name's Violet Firth, but she'll be better known to you as Dion Fortune. Yeah? <laughs> um, Dion Fortune is um, the, probably the greatest um, female occultist that Britain has ever produced. Uh, her books, The Cosmic Doctrine, are, are, are classics, along with her occult novels like The Sea Priestess and The Goat Foot, Foot God. Anybody who's interested in reading some great 20s, 30s uh, uh, novels, hers, hers are great and they're absolutely packed with occult knowledge. And they're, they're very quaint because they're written in you know, very old-fashioned writing of like a hundred years ago. But she does have a good sense of humour, like she calls um, the river Dickmouth. It's on the River Dick, and she lives in Dickmouth and all this. It's actually based around the same, the same area. It's all based around the, um, the, the Glastonbury area. And she's actually buried, and there she is. That's, uh, that's her grave in Glastonbury Cemetery. Uh, the, uh, the organisation that she formed, the um, uh, SIL, it's called. Uh, I've got service leave at night. I can't remember what it's called now. It's called, it still is the abbreviation, it comes to me in a minute. Uh, the organisation that she formed, which used to be in the Golden Dawn um, in, the, in the early 20s, and then she broke off and formed her own thing. Uh, the Society of the Inner Light, that's what it's called. 
and it's still going strong. It's still um, based in both Glastonbury and, and London. And then we also have this, the Goddess Temple. This is um, the first Goddess Temple building that uh, has uh, been erected in Britain. It's been going about 10 years now. And it's a lovely place to visit again. Um, just set it in a, a courtyard off the bottom of the high street. And uh, with every uh, one of the, uh, the changing seasons with the eight festivals of the Wheel of the Year, they, they alter it and they dress it up for which so whichever, wherever you go you're always going to see the actual temple dressed out uh, decorated out in the in the manner that it would be for uh, for that time of year whatever festival that they'll be celebrating and you, you go in you take your shoes off and you can just sit there and meditate and just enjoy it so it's very peaceful very lovely and then of course if you're not into any of all this Glastonbury is great for shopping uh, fantastic fantastic shops lovely pubs but be prepared to have your wallet cleared out. <laughs> um, a great place to, to hang out and, and soak up all the atmosphere. All the shopkeepers are very chatty and lo love to talk to you and everything. Um, so uh, it, it, is, it is very lovely, but if you want to uh, buy anything a bit cheaper, get, go on the net. They won't thank me for saying that, but, uh, but there we go. So, here we go. That gives you some background of what Glastonbury is about. It's got, a, you can see, it's got a long, long history of legend and spirituality, and there's the whole Christian and pagan things all woven into the town and the very fabric of the place. Um, probably one of the most magical places you can you can go to in Britain. So, this is the uh, the subject tonight, the Glastonbury Zodiac. Uh, basically, as Rob said in his introduction, it's twelve figures designed into the landscape around Glastonbury. Nobody really knows how old they are, um, but we do know when they were discovered, uh, or rediscovered perhaps. Um, it was in, in the 1920s by Catherine Maltwood, and that's this beautiful woman. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about Catherine now. Um, she was born in April 1878 to a wealthy family, the Sapwoofs of Woodford Green, Essex. Her father at one time was a local mayor. An intelligent girl, she was sent to a very forward-thinking school for girls, Moira House, where the girls were encouraged, this, this is Moira House on the, on the screen, where the girls were put into groups that were named after various knights from King Arthur's Round Table. So from a very early age, she acquired a deep interest in the mysteries of the Arthurian romances. In 1896, at the age of 18, she studied sculpture at the Slade School of Art. London. Nothing to do with the successful glam rock band, of course. Under the tuition of Sir George Frampton, she became a socialite in London after travelling to Europe to see classical sculptures. She had her own studio in Kensington and mingled with the Bloomsbury set and the London Theosophical Societies. In 1901, at 23 years, she married John Maltwood, who was to become a very successful businessman and master Freemason. Together they travelled far and wide, throughout Europe and Asia, both of them passionately interested in the worldwide culture. They collected antiques and works of art from every country they went to. Between 1911 and 1930, her own sculptures were regularly um, exhibited in London. Her works were very unusual and expressed her interest in ancient history, mythology, oriental philosophy, Buddhism, the occult and theosophy. In 1917, she and her husband moved to Chilton Priory in Somerset. Well, that's Mr. Walkwood, her husband, John. And this is uh, the Priory. 